Did you do a book on John Hayward and T.S. Eliot? Some, some, I bought a book no, when was I was last in York. Someone had a book about the Hayward and, and Eliot. It could have been me. And I think I bought it, yeah. Maybe I should have had one. It's a good book, isn't it? Yes, very good. It was one of those figures I was always interested in. Since his relationship was so yeah. curious with Eliot and uh, long-standing. Yes. Um, mm. I don't know what I would, would have read about this. But I well, have read about it recently. I'm glad you did. Yeah, it was some... I some, haven't done any publicity. Oh, I know what it was. In the book, <laughs> the book collector. Oh, yeah. I, uh, they had a little notice of it. I, I happened to write a piece for the book collector, the issue before the last one about, about my own booking and book collection. So I got to know them and I, I, I agreed, they agreed to send me a couple of issues in lieu of payment kind of thing. And, um, yeah. and, and I noticed that book in there, yeah. This book. Um, huh. Yes, he oh, did okay. mention it. Ferguson. Jamie Ferguson. Right. He's um, quite a friend of mine. I may see him in, 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 in London. And, uh, do you know a guy named John Summers Smith? Yes. Um, he, taught, <laughs> he, he taught me. And I, was uh -huh. in his, I worked in his shop for three years. Oh, ah, well, he, uh, he and I become correspondents. He, he likes my uh, I write, you know, book reviews and essays. So when I come, come here and as a collector, I think, well, I have odds forwards and afterwards, but I have it in the American edition in a jacket, but here it is in the English edition in a jacket. So should I, should I, should I, you know, replace it? Should I up, upgrade it or not? I probably won't, but it's one of those books I would look at if it were, you know, the right, right day or the right uh, price, I would certainly pick it up because I do like odd. And, and then, there's something about English editions that certain publishers like Faber and Faber or Rupert Hart Davis, which I find very satisfying, unlike the American editions. But there's a lot of Max beer bum. I remember in Washington, I would occasionally go around book sales and talk about the books on the tables to visitors to these book sales, these big giant schools uh, uh, annual events and tell them why such and such a book was worth buying or worth collecting. So I GM Young, I have these, so I can't get those. Um, got a lot of James. Recently in London I found at any amount of books for four pounds, the American scene, the first English edition, Ch Chapman and Hall, 1907. Very good shop, isn't it? Yeah, in yeah. The down in the basement, found, as they say, uh, I found the, the American scene there for four pounds, which is a nice, nice. And I'm probably the only person you'll ever meet. Do you collect James? No. I, I do, but I have, I have a lot of James. In fact, I'm, I own two sets of the original New York edition. Yeah. I found one for fifty dollars at a book sale, and <sighs> the the other I was walking around with my wife in part of uh, Maryland, and there was a church bazaar mm -hmm. at the end of the day, and I wandered in there, and they had a couple of boxes, cartons on, the, on a stage in an auditorium of, of books. It was the end of the day, so they were five dollars for each carton. One of the cartons contained the entire New York <laughs> edition again, so I thought, how could I risk resistance? So, so I have two sets. I meant to sell one, but I've never gotten around to it. Talking about Mark Sanders' mm -hmm. last, and, yeah. Um, and in the spirit of book collecting, you know, anything could be anywhere. I was once in Winchester, Virginia, home of the immortal Patsy Cline, a great country mm -hmm. western singer. And after I gave this talk, I said, are there any bookshops in, in, in town? It's a little town. I said, there was one. So I go there, and there on an open shelf like this, um, $5, was a first of Richard Garnett's The Twilight of the Gods, inscribed from Garnett, to Ford Maddox Brown, who was his best friend. I read, I read a, a, Carolyn Heilbrunn wrote a book called The Garnett Family, and I knew that Ford Maddox Brown was his best friend. 
how this book came to be in Virginia for, and how long it had been on a shelf for five dollars. And I later told uh, Mark that I had this book and he, his copy was inscribed from Garnett to his publisher and he said, um, what do you want for yours? It's a, you know, it was a better copy, more desirable because of the connection. I said, Mark, I want to have one book that's better than those in your library, so I still have the book. <laughs> I'll put it down. Why don't you buy a, a bust of Lawrence Stern? Like oh, really? That? I wouldn't mind. I have a, it's a copy of the Nodicans. Huh. Um, how, how much is a bust of Lawrence Stern? 350 pounds. I don't know if I, I could ever get it home is the That's only the problem. problem. Yes. I'd have yeah. to paste it and that would cost 300 Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But it certainly would, would look good in your one's library. It's good company. Yeah. Well, I'm sure some, you know, wise collector will come by. Well, I've got ten of them. I need ten ones. <laughs> 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 um, how do you acquire ten busts of the I have them made. Ah, I see. Right. You yeah. can't have it too many. I'm working on stuff about Edwardian and, and late Victorian popular fiction. So I've been reading a lot of people like, um, well, E. Nesbitt, and um, I've got most of Haggard and Buchan and uh, Mackin and Blackwood. And uh, people who really developed genre literature in this one lifetime, at the end of the 19th, early 20th century, before TV and movies and radio. And they gave us iconic. Figures, Scarlet Pimpernel, Prisoner of Zenda, yeah, yeah, yeah. adventure novels, boys' books, those yeah. sorts of things. Um, so I, I always look for these older books, but I do have this fondness for dandies, so a couple of the burners and the, the beer bun. Yeah. I collect for a bank. Ah, Rainbow. Uh, One of the Rainbow editions here. What's it called there then? Oh, that's the, yes, Rainbow. Uh, and yeah. um, I was looking at think, trying to think of the ones I don't have in the Rainbow, you know, any edition. I could buy all four, or I could buy. Um, There's a beautiful Caprice and Valmouth. I could. I'm not sure if I have those or Vainglory and one of the other ones. Have you seen the collected? Are they the one there volume a, one? No, this is the collected is in five bowls. Duckworth. No, um, I think I saw it once in a shop, but uh, yeah. do you have that? I don't have it, of course, but it's yeah. uh, it's another nice thing. Yeah, I. Um, I have that one volume, one that Anthony Paul wrote the introduction of, and then I have first of several of uh, Brentano's editions, as, as well as uh, Cardinal Pirelli, I have the, the English edition. But I can never remember, I can't remember if, I've, if Caprice and Falmouth were individual volumes uh, that, are, that were reprinted or not. I'll, I think I'll take a look. Well, he's the dandy of all dandies, isn't he? Oh, yeah. They have a great, there's a great exchange where he, one of the books, a guy is introduced to somebody and he says, his, his response is, is to a woman at a, at a party. He says, I think, I believe we've slept together once. <laughs> and she draws back and he says, at the opera. <laughs> or Berenice. <laughs> yes. Or Berenice, yes. <laughs> you remember better than I do. Who's John Gere? Is he anybody you know? Yeah, he's a great man. He Is was a uh, keeper of prints and drawings at the British Museum. Truly? Uh, but he was as literary as he was artistic. Huh. He, well, he, he, you know that book, Geoffrey Madden's Notebooks? If, uh, yes, I have it. You know, well, a little he, paperback he, of it. It was edited by John Gere and ah. John Sparrow. Right. He was wonderful. He had a marvellous collection. Well, then I'll he's get it just to have a Wonderful collector. I never paid more than one and six for a book. Ah, very wise. Always <laughs> travelled by bus. When he died, he left three million. 
Well, this is like, I, I, one reason I'm here, this Thursday night, I'm giving the Richard Lancel and Green lecture to the Sherlock Holmes Society of London. Oh. You know, Richard Lancel and Green right, was yes. the son of Roger Lancel, great collector of, the late great leading collector of you know, Conan Doyle material. But, um, and he mysteriously died. Yeah, I'm so. afraid so. Um, but um, he always traveled by bus in America and kept all his things in, in, in two big shopping bags. Yeah. Yeah, and, and he had marvelous books, but mm. looked as though he were just a cut above homeless, I'm told by friends. Yeah. yeah. Well, obsessive, that yes. was quite obsessed. Well, I can't remember if I have the Valmouth and Caprice, so I should get those. And I'll get these other ones. Hmm? Do yeah. you have, a, have any interest in Corvo or? Corvo, or? yes. I've got um, I've got um, I bought the, the the latest uh, two vo books from that guy. Raven was the biography, and there was another Scobie. about. Huh? Yeah. Robert Scobie. Yes, Scobie. Robert Scobie. I bought I have those, and I have the old. I wrote a piece about uh, A. J. Simmons and and Corvo once for a magazine, and. I collected Simmons's essays and other books as well as the okay, Quest. Must, I must give you my. I did an anniversary catalogue of Simmons. You may have it. No, I don't think so. I'll find. His, I'll try and find oh, it. Oh, he. Yeah, he was. A, I, I, in fact, in, when I was in, in London, I just now I, I picked up a second copy I found of uh, Julian Simmons' biography of his brother. It's a wonderful. It's book. a wonderful book. I yeah. found it 25 years ago in Cambridge and. I read it twice, it was so yes, good. And then I read it again it, a couple of years ago. I haven't read much else of Julian Simmons, have you? Uh, just a you little have. bit of, the, of his yeah. essays. He wrote about the Poe and Conan Doyle. Uh, but I never read his novel. Well, oh, dear. Let me go, I left my bag upstairs. Not so I won't much, oh, very good. <laughs> I can't find much in my own bookshop. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I had that. Julian Simmons' own autobiography, but it's in the 40s. Uh, That's Julian McLaren Ross, Memories ah, of the right, 40s. No, but, Simmons, but he did, but he, Simmons wrote his he own did write some things, yeah. uh, a memoir, yeah. Yeah, and they're, they are pretty wonderful. He tells his story through other people he met. It's quite self effacing. Uh, yeah. Um, and they're all, I think very few of them are literary figures. They're just strangers. Oh, yes, that's no. right. Yes. We've got that upstairs. Yeah. No price, actually. Uh, two, 18. 21. This is unpriced, actually. 21, but I'll send it to you. 25.50. 28.50. 31.50. 30, Thirty-one fifty, thirty-six fifty, and that's free. Okay. The machine's back here. All right. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I'm doing a, been reading a lot of H.G. Wells, and I'm going to write a long piece about H.G. Wells. It's come out of copyright just recently. Oxford has reissued um, the novels in the first editions in paperback. Previous editions have tended to use the Atlantic edition that Wells revised in 1924. But, you know, I wouldn't mind finding the, you know, the time machine for you know, 50p somewhere. But other than that... Uh,
Uh, I think it's you, why bookshops are, are still wonderful is that you don't always know what you want until you see it. And you can't have that experience quite online. Uh, you know, you, so you, you look and you see what speaks to you. Or, you know, or as I say, if, you, if, I've, if you've got a project, or I have a project. For example, I, all these, these girls' books and boys' books, I, I, I don't collect them, but I have a couple examples of them, because I like, like the, those, those pictorial bindings. This is Stella Gibbons' book. I don't know. Yes, yeah. I, you always know Cold Comfort Farm, and of course like Reggie Oliver. I read, I read his biography we'll called The Bachelor. Right? Yeah. So, books that uh, know nothing about. So here's, a, here's a book that interests me. George Gamow, the mathematician. <clears throat> um, Mr. Tompkins in Wonderland. It's it's a kind of a talking about mathematics in terms, of, in terms of Wonderland, but it's dedicated to Lewis Carroll and Niles Bohr. Which is, uh, if you wrote a book I read as a boy called One, Two, Three, Infinity, which was uh, kind of my introduction to mathematical games of play, playfulness. I might, I, might, I might possibly get this. I think. Midnight Folk, I already have this, but it's a wonderful book. But not as good as the Box of Delights. Mm -hmm. John Macefield. But here's the other problem, like T.F. Powell. I'm interested in the Powell brothers and their books, but I have a couple of them. I haven't read any of his yet, so it seems like I shouldn't buy one, you know, too much more until I've actually tried them. So. I just look, I have all the series, but for example, this one is introduced by Richard Lancelin Green, who was the great collector of Sherlockiana, who died under mysterious circumstances. There was a New Yorker article by David Grant about him, the premise that some thought he was, it was a suicide, which it probably was. But there was also speculation that a rival Sherlockian with connections to special forces had sent assassin. The thing is, this guy's never identified in the New Yorker article, but everybody in, in the circle knows, knows who he was who in fact was uh, an advisor uh, high up in the Pentagon in, in charge of special forces, and, or at least some aspect of them. He could never be talk about them. He was the guy who got me involved with the Baker Street Irregulars, in fact. It's a possibility, too. How did I start walking with writing for the Washington Post? Yeah, so I wrote to the editor of Book World. Yeah, so he liked my letter and said, come by. And I had coffee and he said he would send me a book sometimes. Months went by. And then one day on a Friday, I got a call from an editor named Kurt Suplee. Could I review a book by John Gardner called In the Suicide Mountains? It was a kind of YA novel by John Gardner who wrote Grendel, but Beowulf from the monster's point of view. Already I'd been watching long enough to know, yes, of course I could do that, having never read a word of John Gardner. Uh, came home from work, and the book was there. They'd sent it by courier, and I was really impressed by that. But I didn't know much about newspapers, never having worked on one. And for some reason, Kurt had not included a review slip saying when the review was due. 
I knew it was a brief notice because that's how he told me that. And that was only 200 words. You got 200 words and a sign or your name, no, no ID or anything like that. It was the way we tested people out in those days. Um, so I read the book that night. And the next morning, I sat down and I spent the entire Saturday crafting, as they say in English, uh, creative writing classes, my 200 words until they were perfect. You could etch them on Trajan's column. Um, I could put a fresh ribbon in my typewriter. We still had typewriters back then. And this is where I had my stroke of genius. My wife, Marion, is an expert on paper. The artist paper, but any kind of paper. I said, do you have any kind of really cool typing paper, bond paper? And she had this thick, creamy Italian bond paper and sort of thought it was vellum. And so I crank it into the typewriter. I type my, my 200 words. Then I write a little note, my fountain pen, you know, hope this will do, happy to do more. Everybody liked the review, or so they said. Of course, the editors always say they like the review. Uh, and then they tell me to pick, but they didn't. The art director, like the artist, suggested because the book was illustrated by Joe Cervello and had some striking pictures. Uh, but most important of all, Bill McPherson was a real esthete. And he, he called me up and he said, Basically, you know, well, the review is fine, but where did you get this paper? I must have some of this paper. By this time, I'd been in Washington long enough to know that it was a, it worked by quid pro quo. And I said, you know, well, give me some more work and maybe I'll get you a ream of this stuff. So I started writing more reviews. And after I'd written about nine or ten, they asked me if I'd be interested in a job. Diaries and letters. Good morning. Um, I've just been talking about with my, my friend John Clute about Ishiguro, who's just won the Nobel Prize, and I see they have two of his books here, reasonably priced, which I do not have, and certainly not in the English edition, so it's a culturally appropriate moment to invest in Ishiguro. Then I look for favorite writers, Woodhouse or Law, or Randall Jarrell, people that I've been growing up reading all my life, or seemingly all my life. And uh, occasionally I will try to change, you know, follow the flag. So I have a lot of Elon Wong, for example. Uh, actually, I have this book in the, in the Chapman Hall, just so I don't need, but if it was an American, I, could, I might you know, consider upgrading. The, the English edition, and it's also also just fun if you're an American to come to, to British uh, bookshops because you tend to see the American editions of books, and here it's it's neat to see. Yeah, you know, here's here's Flashman and, and the Tiger, which has a completely different cover in America, so it's it's sort of, sort of fun to pull them out, even if you're not going to buy them, to see what they look like here, and any books that I can't read the spine of or and with my eyes declining these days like most you know any any faded spine is hard to read let's see, let's see what's there be surprised more writer haggard which I have let's see here Robert, if I have this before the bombardment, Robertson Davies is a great admirer of this book, Osbert Sitwell's. And I love to see the, the Woodhouses. They're always, if they're in jackets, they're always expensive, even if they're earlier books, but the jackets are often fun.
and you have to look just in case they made a mistake. That all sometimes happens. I, I, I don't have to have first editions per se, but I like do have like to have the cloth books, and if I can, I'll get the first editions. But I'm, I'm not going to pay hundreds of dollars for one. Just I do do still think the text is most important, just to read it, enjoy it. Uh, Shaw, uh, particularly back to Methuselah, because a friend of mine that I only know via email, Brian Showers, is doing a book of Irish fantasy writers, an encyclopedia. And uh, we were talking, and he showed me the list of the writers he had lined up, and uh, people were going to write them. And I noticed he said he didn't have any Shaw. I said, you know, plays like Back to Methuselah and the Don Juan and Hell section of Man and Superman would certainly fit in with uh, Irish fantasy, in the, in the, at least in the wide sense. So I, I couldn't find my... I have, I have Back to Methuselah somewhere, but I just thought I would look here to see what they have. And of course, you have, a, you have a ch the challenge that book, book collectors and book people are always having to deal with. You can buy... This is the, sort of the first edition of Back to Methuselah. This is the, the revised edition that he did, but it's not clear from anything I can see how much or how little he revised it, so how different it is. And then you have this little Oxford World Classics, which is the 500th volume of the Oxford World Classics, and it is the revised edition with a new postscript. So if you were to buy one, which one would you buy? Would you buy the first? The revised, which is in the standard edition, or the smaller, less easily read, but with the new postscript version. Of course, the completists would buy them all. Um, I will probably leave them all, figuring I could get Bernard Shaw in America readily enough, but I thought I would look anyway. Uh, although, the, although the little Oxford World Classics is, is kind of attractive. I always like those books you could slip in your pocket. So. Uh, I may, I may, I may mull this one over. Let's see what happens. One plus five. Yes. Well, my favorite funny book, humorous book, and it is, it is a viciously humorous book and uh, complete drips with irony is. Augustus Carp Esquire by himself, a novel written by a judge named H. H. Bashford, but it is just hilarious. I first learned about it when Anthony Burgess said it was the, the, the funniest unknown novel in the world. It's now been reprinted by Pryan, and uh, there was a Penguin edition and uh, uh, a Folio Society edition. I, I, I finally I bought a, a first edition recently because I liked it so well and wanted to have the, the first. But it is it is amazingly uh, funny in a, in a in a dark humorous way. Uh, hard to quote from. Uh, F. Anstey's Vice Versa, which I read not too long ago, is, doesn't strike me as terribly funny anymore. Uh, but he did write one called Turmalin's Time Checks uh, about a guy who can go back in time through the use of uh, so I'm saving time in, the, in, a, in a periods when you didn't want it, and then using that time to go back to periods that you enjoyed and make them last longer. And it's, it's hilarious. It's very much like Woodhouse. I love Waugh, Woodhouse, um, James Thurber, um, Woody Allen. He, you know, Allen, he wrote uh, three books of uh, New Yorker-style essays. They're very funny. Um, I mean, Woodhouse's similes uh, constantly cracked me up. The, uh, he drank coffee with the air of a man who regretted it was not hemlock. Uh, he just throws these things out. All out. So, um, yeah, I like those. Uh, Terry Pratchett's novels, uh, the, the Discworld books. 
are always very restful to read. I, you know, A.S. Byatt said they were the books that made her happiest of all the books written in our generation. Right, hello. Yes, I have, yes. I wish I could spend another day here.